Welcome back to the Physics Dojo. Today, we're going to have a look at relative motion. All right, so when you're in the middle of a unit on relative motion, it's easy to fool yourself into thinking that it's all about boats crossing rivers and airplanes flying in the wind, as if we're trying to train you to become a pilot of a, of a plane or the captain of a ship. But really, relative motion is deeper than that. It's actually really neat if you get to the point of genuinely understanding it. To help, let's start with a simple question. What's the velocity of this calculator right now? The most intuitive answer is to say zero, and truth be told, I want to be able to use that as an answer, but I want to explore the possibility that it's actually more complicated than that. This calculator is certainly not moving across my table. In the language of relative motion, I can say that the velocity of the calculator is zero with respect to this table. The table's being used as my frame of reference. In fact, the table is really anchored to the ground, which is itself a part of the Earth. So I guess what I'm really trying to say is that the velocity of the calculator is zero with respect to the Earth at large. But I know that the Earth is turning about its axis. It rotates roughly every 24 hours. It also orbits around the Sun. So if I could somehow see this calculator from a point of view outside of the Earth, kind of looking down at the entire solar system, I would actually see that the calculator is kind of twirling around with the Earth's rotation as it orbits around the Sun. In other words, the velocity of the calculator with respect to the solar system at large is certainly not zero. So what is it? Is the velocity of the calculator really zero? Or is it really not zero? The answer is, that wasn't a very good question. Velocity is not something that we can describe in any absolute or real sense. All motion, surprisingly, is relative. All right, so to help make sense of relative motion, I've created a very simple simulation in interactive physics. I've got two objects of note here. I've got a rectangle and I've got a circle. I'm going to refer to them by the first letters of those words. So I'm going to refer to this as the R for the rectangle and the C for the circle. Now, I've also created a stopwatch. It's going to keep track of time while the simulation's running. And I've also programmed in a pause control so that the simulation will stop itself after one second into the simulation. I'm just going to run the simulation and we're going to see what happens. All right. So the rectangle looks like it's standing still. The circle has advanced to the right by exactly five meters. So what I would say here, based on what I just saw, is that the velocity of the circle appeared to be five meters per second. Now, the important thing to note here is that the rectangle was standing still, or at least it appeared to be. I'm going to say that the rectangle is serving as my frame of reference. I'm looking at it from the rectangle's point of view. In fact, there's a little eye icon on the rectangle showing me exactly that. I've actually programmed that in. We're looking at it from the rectangle's point of view. So in this simulation, the rectangle is serving as the frame of reference, and the circle is just an object that happens to be moving relative to that frame reference. So in symbol form, I'm going to say VC R equals 5 meters per second. The first subscript indicates the object in motion. The second subscript indicates the object serving as the frame reference. So VC R is the velocity of the circle with respect to the rectangle. And it's 5 meters per second. Now, I'm going to run the simulation again, but this time I'm going to switch over to looking at it from the circle's point of view. I've already set this up ahead of time. So the little eye icon has been removed from the rectangle. We're going to now look at the exact same simulation from the circle's point of view. Now, I do have to make a little change down here as well, just to indicate that the meter sticks are being used effectively by the circle. So let's see what the circle sees. Now again, I have to stress this is the exact same simulation, just viewed from a different point of view, from the circle's frame of reference. So what does the circle see? Well, actually, it sees something a little different. The circle sees itself as stationary. Makes sense. Objects will always see themselves as stationary. But this time, the rectangle appeared to be moving to the left. It actually covered the full five meters in that one second. So in other words, the velocity of the rectangle, as seen by the circle, which I'm going to write down as VRC, is actually negative five meters per second. The circle sees the rectangle coming towards it. So VCR the velocity of the circle with respect to the rectangle, that's the first animation that we saw, was positive 5 meters per second, but the animation that we're looking at now is the opposite. The velocity of the rectangle with respect to the circle is negative 5. Now more generally, we can do this anytime we find convenient. We can reverse the roles of the frame of reference and the object in motion. We do that by doing two things. 
We reverse the order of the subscripts, so VCR becomes VRC. Subscripts are reversed, and the direction of the velocity is also reversed. By the way, in case you're curious, let me show you the way I actually set the simulation up in the first place. Let me go to what in the program it refers to as the home frame reference, kind of this outside point of view. Just zoom back in here so we can see it. What I actually did was I gave the circle a velocity of 2 meters per second to the right, and I gave the rectangle a velocity of 3 meters per second to the left. And I set these rulers or these meter sticks up as just little objects that I could actually control their velocity independently. Let me give them a velocity of zero so that they're standing still. So in the frame reference of the virtual world in the simulation at least, this is what happened. The meter sticks are standing still right now. The, the circle is moving to the right at two meters per second and the rectangle is moving to the left at three meters per second. Now before you say, oh, so that's really what was happening, it was really a circle moving to the right and a rectangle moving to the left, I want to point out a crazy important thing here, and that is that that's actually not true. The state of motion is actually only sensible in a relative way. None of these are what I would call the real motion. So really, I have my options. I could say that the velocity of the circle with respect to the virtual world in here was 2 meters per second at the right, while the velocity of the rectangle with respect to the world was 3 meters per second at the left. That's the simulation we're looking at right now. That is one valid interpretation. With respect to the virtual world of the program, the circle moved to the right at 2, the rectangle moved to the left at 3. But the other interpretations are equally valid. In the circle's frame of reference, the circle... Oop, yeah, got to change those meter sticks to keep up. In the circle's frame reference, the circle was standing still, and the rectangle did all of the moving at 5 meters per second to the left. And in the rectangle's frame reference, just to jump back to that one last time, meter sticks keeping up with it, it's the circle that did all the moving. They're all valid. All right, so I've created another animation to play around a little bit more with relative motion. What I've got here is a red car, and I'm going to refer to it by the color red, as symbolized by the letter R. It's resting on a blue surface, which I'm going to refer to by the letter B. Right here, B. Now, I've got a control here for the velocity of the red car with respect to the blue surface, and I can put any value I want in here, and the car will move appropriately. I've got a stopwatch here for time, just like before, and I've got a pause control of one second again, so it'll stop itself after one. So, with a velocity of five meters per second, in one second it should move five meters, each of these squares is one meter wide, so in one second it would make sense that the car moves five meters. So I think that's working. Let me just try it out with a different value here just to test that out. So if I give it the velocity of the red car with respect to the blue surface a value of negative two, the car will move to the left, covering two meters in one second. Perfect. All right, let me go back to five. Now, I've created another control, which is just out of sight here. I'm going to bring it in to play. Right about there should work. Now, whereas I've got the V of the red with respect to the blue, I also have the velocity of the blue with respect to the green. Now, I know what you're thinking. Where's the green? Well, let me zoom out a little bit to reveal it. Aha! Uh -huh. So, the green is actually a surface down here, and it turns out that the blue surface is not a simple surface at all, but rather a giant blue car with a little red car resting on top of it. And this is the velocity of that blue car with respect to the green surface. Now, before you start wondering if the green is actually yet a bigger car on, uh, the, on, on which the blue car rests, I was tempted to do that, but no, the green is just a simple surface, unfortunately. So I do have these two values, though, that I can type in, and right now the velocity of the blue with respect to the green is zero. So if I run the simulation, this is the simulation we really did just see. The blue is stationary with respect to the green. Okay, but what if I change that? What if I give the, um, the blue a velocity of five meters per second, and let me try to zero out the velocity of the red with respect to the blue. Let's just see how that plays out. So I run the simulation, and sure enough, the blue is moving along. It covers five meters in one second. And the red car, well, did it move? Let me, let me show you that simulation again with the question, did it move? And the answer to that is, it depends on what you mean. Did it move with respect to the blue surface? Well, no. It's still in the exact same part of the blue surface that it began at. So the velocity of the red with respect to the blue truly is zero. 
and yet in a different way, in a different frame of reference, it did move. Let me bring this, um, this marker down so that we can see how it compares to the green surface here. Maybe, um, well, maybe about here somewhere should work. Okay, so does the red car move with respect to the green? And the answer is, well, yeah, actually it's being dragged along with the blue car, so it also moves five meters in that second. So the velocity of the red car can be described in two different ways. It is zero with respect to the blue, but it also is five with respect to the green surface. Now, to change frames of reference, or to, to combine relative motions, what we can do is we can do vector addition. Here's how it works. If I take VRB and I add VBG, I'm actually going to calculate the velocity of the red object in the green frame of reference. Now there's a pattern here that I'm going to stress when I do a couple of examples with you right away, but here it is. There are four subscripts here. RB here, BG here. There's four subscripts in total. If I have B and B on the inside, then if I perform an addition, I will get the velocity of the red with respect to the green. I'm going to refer to this as the outside pair of subscripts, RG. I'm going to refer to this B and B as the inside pair of subscripts. And if I perform that addition, I'm going to get VRG. And I've kind of had that hidden all along as well. So if I add 0 plus 5, I actually get 0, uh, sorry, I actually get 5 meters per second. Yeah, 0 plus 5 is 5. So VRB plus VBG is equal to VRG. So run the simulation, and it works. 5 meters per second. Let's try something more interesting. Let's make them both 5 meters per second. So once again, red will move with respect to blue at 5. Blue will move with respect to green at 5. What will be the velocity of the red with respect to the green? Well, we should be able to add these and get 10. So if I run the simulation, we actually see that it is 10. And look at that red car go. It's actually covering 10 meters across the green surface in a second. 10 meters per second. And yet only 5 meters across the blue surface. If I change the blue with respect to green to be negative 5, so the blue car will move to the left at 5 meters per second, this relative velocity addition should still work. 5 plus negative 5 actually equal to 0, and you'll see that right away. Go. So the red car is moving to the right across the blue surface, but the blue surface is moving to the left across the green surface. And in this case, the net effect of that is 0. Let's change that to something a bit different. What if I give the velocity of the red car a velocity of um, 7 meters per second? Well, oop, I actually didn't take that. Try that. 7. Oh, I've maxed it out at 5. Okay, well, we'll slow it down to 3. So red with respect to blue is 3, blue with respect to green is negative 5. If I add these relative velocities, I'll get VRG, which in this case should be negative 2. So let's see how that works. Yep, the red car is moving to the right with respect to the blue car, and yet, if I play it again, it's moving to the left with respect to the green surface. VRB plus VBG equals VRG. And as one last example, if I tried negative 5 for both, uh, yeah, for both, I find that that red car moves quite quickly to the left with respect to the green surface. VRB plus VBG equals VRG. All right, let's review. The motion of an object can be kept track of in more than one frame reference. To keep track of this, we use two subscripts. The first subscript is the object that we are describing the velocity of, and the second subscript is the object serving as the frame of reference. So the velocity of 1, 2 would be the object of velocity object number 1 with respect to object number 2. The velocity of a car with respect to the Earth could be recorded as VCE. We can reverse the roles of those two objects by reversing the order of those subscripts and reversing the direction itself. So if the velocity of a car with respect to the Earth is 2 meters per second to the east, then the velocity of the earth with respect to the car would be 2 meters per second to the west. Also, we can change the velocity of an object in one frame reference to a different frame reference by adding relative velocities. Now there's an order to the subscripts here. The velocity of 1 with respect to 2 plus the velocity of 2 with respect to 3 is equal to the velocity of 1 with respect to 3. It's hard to keep track of, but it's easier once you actually look at the subscripts. The inner pair on the right side of the equation have to be the same. The outer pair is exactly what you get when you do the addition. Let's try to make some sense of this by doing some pen and paper examples. All right, let's try a couple of examples that I prepared ahead of time. 
As always, you can download this as a PDF from my website, so you can print it and follow along if you wish, or use it for future reference. Okay, first example. A bus moves east at 20 meters per second with respect to the Earth. What's the velocity of the Earth with respect to the bus? This is a really, really, really straightforward question, but it's just enough to get us started here. So let me record the information that I know. The velocity of the bus, I'll use a B for bus, with respect to the Earth, E, is 20 meters per second, and I know that that direction is to the east. All right, so V, B, E means velocity of bus with respect to the Earth, 20 meters per second to the east. The question that I'm being asked for is, what is the velocity of the Earth with respect to the bus? Well, there's not much to it. All I have to do is reverse the order of the subscripts, which I achieve by reversing the direction. To write that in a mathematical form, here's what I'm going to do. V, E, B is the opposite negative for the direction of V, B, E. So it is the opposite of the 20 meter per second to the east, which I would much prefer to write this way. V, E, B applying that negative to the direction 20 meters per second to the west. And that's my answer to the first question. Like I said, really straightforward. Let's try another one. Alright, in the second example, we have a boat moving through the water to the north, and this water is flowing. It's uh, perhaps a river that has current in it. The question we have is, what's the velocity of the boat with respect to the earth? Okay, let's start by organizing ourselves. First sentence says that I have a boat, so velocity of a boat, moving through the water, the water is serving as the frame reference there, at 3 meters per second to the north. I know that the water itself is flowing, so velocity of water with respect to the earth is also known to be 5 meters per second, moving to the south. The question that I have is, what is the velocity of the boat with respect to the earth? Okay, so if I want to know the velocity of the boat with respect to the earth, I have to change to a new frame reference, since I know the velocity of the boat in a different frame reference. Okay, so let's remember that pattern that I was talking about. The velocity of the boat with respect to the Earth is equal to the velocity of something something plus velocity something something. I like to think about it this way each and every time, even if it's simple. The pattern says that I have to have the exact same thing in those inside spots. They could be anything, it doesn't really matter as long as they're the same. Meanwhile, the outside pair is going to give me what I'm looking for. So I know that I have to have a B in that very first spot, I have to have an E in that very last spot in order to get VBE, and I can fill in those inside spots with the same letter. Now the only other candidate that I have to work with here is W, so I'll slip that in. So the velocity of boat to water plus the water, velocity of water to earth will give me the velocity of boat to earth. Now you might think that I'm overdoing it here and that I'm making something simple complicated, and, well, you'd probably be right in this particular example, but be warned, the next example will reveal exactly why I'm doing this. So, to achieve this, I'm just going to add these velocity vectors, which is actually pretty straightforward. The velocity of BE is equal to velocity of BW, that's 3 to the north, 3 meters per second north, plus velocity of WE, which is 5 meters per second to the south, and these vectors are pretty trivial to add here. V, B, E, since they're opposite in direction, I'm essentially subtracting to get 2 meters per second, going with the direction of the larger, which is south. So, problem solved. And again, that was really simple by design. Let's try the third and final example for this video. In this one we have a plane. It's flying at 80 meters per second to the east with respect to the Earth, and there's a wind blowing to the south. We're asked for the heading and airspeed of the plane. All right, let's, uh, let's translate this question. First sentence says, the plane is flying with respect to the Earth. So I'll record that as velocity of the plane with respect to the Earth, and I see that it is 80 meters per second to the east. All right, so there's the first sentence in symbol form. Second sentence says there's a wind blowing. Okay, now, wind, I don't really like to think of that as an object, it's not even a material. Really, what wind is, is air that happens to be moving with respect to the Earth. 
So I'm going to record that wind as the velocity of the air with respect to the Earth. That's my preference. It is 20 meters per second, and the direction is south. So that's what wind is, air moving with respect to the Earth. Now, the next piece here is a little bit of a puzzler for a lot of students the first time they come across something like this. There's some vocabulary issues here. Now, heading and airspeed, in the context of a plane at least, are very, very closely related. The word airspeed is a bit misleading. It might sound like we're discussing the velocity of the air itself, but that's not the case. Sorry, this is a language issue, not really a physics issue. The velocity, um, or sorry, the airspeed itself actually refers to the velocity of the plane with respect to the air. That's what airspeed actually is. Actually, it's the magnitude of that vector. And heading refers to the direction of that velocity. More generally, the word heading means the direction of motion of an object with respect to the medium that you're moving through. So an air, uh, sorry, a plane heading is really a plane with respect to the air, and a boat heading would be a velocity of a boat with respect to the water. So really, heading and airspeed together are the magnitude and direction of VPA. That's what we're looking for. Okay, now, to find VPA, I'm going to need an equation. VPA equal to. Now, I know the pattern here. It's going to be V something something plus V something something. Now, a lot of students will make the mistake of just jumping in here and saying, yeah, 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 I've got my two vectors here, the blue one and the red one. I know how to add vectors. I'm off to the races and I'm going to get my answer in no time flat. Caution, you don't always add the vectors that you are handed. And that's why this pattern of subscripts is so important. Let's think about this really carefully. We've already established that the outside pair is what you're going to get. That means that I need to start with a P in that very first spot and an A in that very last spot. The inside pair could be anything as long as it's the same. In this case, the only remaining candidate is the Earth, E. So if I want the VPA, plane to air, I can add the velocity of the plane to Earth plus the velocity of the Earth to air. Now there's a little bit of a catch. I do know the velocity of the plane with respect to the Earth. It's that number that I wrote in blue, 80 meters per second to the east. But I don't actually know yet the velocity of the Earth with respect to the air. I don't have the VEA, but I do have something close. I have the velocity of the air with respect to the Earth. And I know that I can swap the order of the subscripts, VEA, as long as I reverse the direction. So 20 meters per second to the north. So to get VPA, I am going to add vectors, but the two vectors that I'm going to add, referring to my colors here, are the blue one, 80 to the east, and my magenta one, 20 to the north. So let me write that out to be really, really, really clear. The velocity of PA is equal to the blue one, 80 meters per second to the east, plus the magenta one, 20 meters per second to the north. Now, these vectors are perpendicular to one another, but that's okay. We know how to add vectors if they're perpendicular, or in any generic case, if you need a review, you can check my videos on adding vectors. But on the assumption that you remember how to do that, I'm just going to proceed. I can draw this as a triangle, starting with uh, 80 meters per second to the east, adding on to that a tip to tail arrangement, 20 to the north. The resultant of these two is the vector that I'm looking for, VPA. Now, remember the air speed is the magnitude of that vector, and the heading is the direction of that vector. So let me get the air speed as the magnitude. And of course, being a right triangle, I can do that with Pythagoras. So VPA will be equal to the square root of, I'll just take the 80 and I will square it and then add to that my 20, which I also don't forget to square. All of that inside of the square root. So grabbing my calculator quickly, square root of 80 squared plus 20 squared which my calculator says, well, with me rounding it off to maybe a single decimal place, 82.5. 82 82.5 meters per second. That's the airspeed. 
Now the heading is the direction of that. So theta, which I can calculate using my triangle, uh, I've got an opposite of 20 and an adjacent of 80, so I can use a inverse 10 of opposite, so that's going to be again the 20, over the adjacent, which is 80, inverse 10 of that, grabbing my calculator one more time, inverse 10 of 20 over 80, and I'm getting 14.0 degrees, I'm just going to call it 14 degrees. 14 degrees, and referencing my diagram, I can see that that is north of east. So there's your heading, there's your airspeed, 82.5 meters per second at 14 degrees north of east. And that should do it for the, for the examples. All right, I hope that was helpful for you to get a good introduction to relative motion. If you haven't had enough relative motion yet, be sure to check out my other video, which is dedicated to boats crossing rivers. It is relative motion, but I figured it deserved a, ta a video all to itself. Be sure to check out my other videos on all kinds of physics tutorials, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me at the address on your screen. Be sure to hit like and subscribe if you appreciate these videos, and I hope to catch you next time at the Physics Dojo. Bye-bye.